Okay, okay. So uh, this week we're going to continue talking about how to um, texture our little house here. Now over the past seven days, hopefully you spent some time and you've created a really good model for your house. Okay. It was technically due at 9 a.m. this morning, and this, is, and this is definitely something that we need to wrap up as fast as humanly possible to make sure that we can you know, kind of advance ourselves into the next stage. Okay? There's a couple things I wanted to focus on today. First is going to be the process of creating or applying what are called tiling textures, and I'm going to introduce a really great resource that will help you very quickly uh, zero in on some great textures, pictures if you will, that we can place on our models themselves. So here's my little house. And as you can see, I need to go in and start placing some tiling textures inside of this environment. It's pretty basic, it's pretty, pretty stark at the moment. So let's go in and start assigning some, some connections here, some material groups that will allow us to very quickly, let me get rid of some of these other ones. These are from yesterday, oops, there we go. So here it is, looking pretty good. I like this. That's a good little model, okay? Um, you know, hopefully as you continue to flush out the details of your house, I hope that you spend some time and, and really follow our modeling practice. This is, this is a little, you know, a blacksmith shop that I created for, for another class, but it does a really great job of illustrating some of the challenges that you're going to be interfacing this week when it comes to applying textures on it. And remember our process. If you're struggling to find the overall form of your house, Go back to the basics. Define your house with a series of simple shapes, okay? And, you know, I practice what I preach. Here's my layout mesh. Here's my basic one. If you look at the geometry on this house, or on this version of the house, it's incredibly simple. It's not great geometry, but it's an important stage as we begin to conceptualize the total volume, the area that the entire house is going to dominate inside of our scene. This is a critical stage for us because in every sense we're kind of you know, visualizing the three-dimensionality of this object. So don't forget about this simple, shape, this simple shape practice that we've been working on over and over and over again throughout the entire semester. Rough it out. Describe it with a whole series of simple cubes. And if you look at mine, this is not good geometry at all. I did this in about 10 minutes just using some rectangles, okay? Just kind of blocking things out trying to understand the totality of the shape that I'm creating, and then I'll advance into making it a little bit more refined. Sure. So some of this stuff in here is, um, you know, I've got some reference, some backdrop images. This is an empty mesh item that's not doing a single thing. This is the high-res version of my, of my mesh. Here's the rough. This is the layout one that I'm currently, currently working on. Shadow catcher, a camera, and then this stuff we'll talk about here in a minute. All right. So if you look carefully at what I've created here, this is not good geo. A lot of crossed polygons. The roof collapses in on its shelf, uh, in on itself. Excuse me. I'm just trying to quickly describe the shape and get a good sense of how big it is, how much space it dominates, and starting to highlight some important architectural details that eventually I need to refine. Okay. Now, from this stage, we're going to advance into the next stage. And I know the struggle, because I've been there myself. A lot of folks, they don't want to do this, because ultimately, you're going to have to remodel it again, right? And no one likes having to remodel something, or redo anything for that matter, right? This is not something that's limited to just the 3D world. Get over that apprehensions, OK? Welcome to our industry. This is part of our workflow, right? We want to define the total shape first, make corrections, you know, I, this. Making changes to this shape is wicked easy right now. Because I'm working probably only with 100 polygons. It's basic blocky shapes. I can make changes quickly, iterate my design, look at it from a number of literal different views, and make sure that I'm really happy with the overall form before I advance into throwing a lot more polygons and describing more detail. So here's the next version of this. Here's the rough layout. This is looking pretty good. It's another level of detail. You can start to see that many of the details are com literally coming to the surface here. And I'm putting more you know, polygonal geometry in that's going to describe you know, important parts of the mesh itself. OK? All right, we'll, we'll stop here. I, I actually go on to do a high-res one as well, but I don't think I grabbed 
Yeah, I don't grab. I didn't grab the right one. The high res one has all the roof shingles in here, more compelling information. You can see that with the the version that I grabbed, I go in and I and I literally model every single plank on here. I throw down geometry for it um, and start to customize directly how this thing is going to look. Okay. All right, but today I want to start spending some time really focusing on creating textures for this. Okay. So uh, how we texture something big, like a house, is a little bit different than how we would texture something small. Okay? We want to use what's called a tiling texture, which is a texture, an image, a photograph, if you will, that's going to repeat. Imagine it's going to be stamped down, both horizontally and vertically, infinite, infinitely in either direction um, inside of our three-dimensional scene. What's cool about these tiling textures is that if we choose the correct one, and if we're very selective, we're not going to see any sort of visible seam in between each stamp, okay? In between, you know, the repeating tile as it goes horizontally and vertically. So what's, uh, what's kind of useful about this process is that I can flood, if you will, entire areas of my model with a simple texture quickly that will describe general areas. Okay, let me show you a really great example of this. Let's start off, and I would encourage you to, to practice and follow along with the birdhouse that you just made. I think I'm going to go in and do like the bottom, the first floor. I want this to be kind of a stony, you know, aggregate material. So let's create a material group. Let's call this stone. And now we need to go find a picture, an image map. And I would like you, I would like to introduce you to probably one of my most favorite resources on the web. It's called textures.com. I want you to get away from using just the Google image search to find images to place on your objects. How we use images in the 3D workflow is wholesale just different than how we would use images over inside of a traditional graphic designer web design workflow, right? For us, those tiling textures are really important. They're rare. We don't really find them. The 3D industry is really the only place that we use tiling textures a lot. And textures.com is my go-to library for, for tiling textures. You have to sign up. There's a free account and a pro account. I'll be honest with you. I've only ever had the free account. I've been coming to this website for probably, oh, I don't know, 15 years. I mean, it's as close to an industry standard resource library as we can get out there. Everyone in our world knows and goes and uses the textures that are found on textures.com. It's a great, great library. I'm kind, of, uh, I'm kind of of the frame of mind that if they don't have it, you don't need it, right? Because they have everything in here, and it is comprehensive. They do a pretty good job of updating and adding new stuff all the time. So it, uh, it's a library and a resource that continues to get better. So let's go in and start navigating around here. Let's see, I think I'm going to go into the brick category. And then, um, let's see, let's do rounded. Let's see if we can find a good one. Ah, oh, yeah, there's a lot of good textures in here. I like it. Me likey. This one's pretty good right here. I like that one. Let's go with that one for a second. Now, when you click on an image on the website, you're going to see a whole series of options. And there are many, many choices on the website that's going to give you a seamless or tiling texture. Seamless and tiling are kind of synonymous. They're interchangeable. If you look right here closely, check it out. Here's the image that I want to work with. We actually can preview a seamless pattern of this texture. And there it is. Okay, So that's one small image being repeated, stamp, 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 both horizontally and vertically in a grid. Now, if you look closely, do you see any sort of noticeable seam in there? You see, you see the pattern repeating, but do you see any sort of hard edge or ugly transition between the tiles? No, and that's why we want to use these tiling textures so that we can flood a very large area of our model with this pattern and not have to worry about seeing that seam. Okay? We have to be selective in certain areas, and this is a really great example. We can very quickly notice the pattern repeating over and over again. But when, when it's on a model, that's not going to be as apparent, because there's going to be a number of other things influencing our audience's understanding of this texture, including the geometry, the lighting, and the, uh, and the rendering functionality of our render. Okay, So there's uh, point being, don't worry about these patterns repeating. Nine times out of 10, you're not necessarily going to see it. 
Let's go ahead and download this one real fast. Let me hit the back button. Let me snag it. Just download it. I've uh, told my internet browser to download all my textures to uh, my desktop. And let's get this thing in. Let's go over into our, our shader tree real fast and start applying that texture into the material group that's assigned to the polygons on the first floor of my house. So there's my material group. How do I get an image, a, f a picture, a texture into that material group? What's the workflow? Add layer. Add layer. Image map. Load image. Okay, and now we're going to go find that image on a computer. And for me, it's just chilling at my desktop. Aha! Wonderful. And there it is. You can see that it's now been flooded across all the polygons inside of that area. Okay. So that, that's a really good question. If you look carefully at my texture here, what's wrong with it? It's very low. It's too big, right? So I need to go in and edit a couple features of the texture to ensure that it's being placed on the polygons correctly. Yes, ma'am. So let's let's walk through it one more time. So make sure your material group is selected. And then add layer, image map. Load image. OK. So if you go back a couple weeks, there we go. If you go back a couple weeks, uh, what, what item inside of our rendering system is completely responsible? for placing the image, the picture, the texture, if you will, on our model. Does anyone remember what it's called? It's an important one, and one that we're going to continue to work with going forward. It's called the texture locator. Every image, when it's imported into Moto, gets assigned a texture locator. And that texture locator is physically responsible for determining where this image is going to be placed on our polygons. Now, if we click on the texture inside of our shader tree and explore the properties, there it is. It's the texture locator. We can click on it and change some, a, a few very, very important, uh, for important properties. Which one do I need to change? What's the first thing we should look to change on the texture locator itself? Yeah, the projection type, right? Because the projection type determines how this image is placed on the polygons themselves. And generally speaking, we want to try to match the projection type to the surface shape that this image is going on to, right? So what's the general surface shape here of the first floor of my house? It's a rectangle, right? So it's basically a glorified cube. So if we analyze the different projection types in our list right here, Ah, check it out. We have one called cubic. And if we click on it, you can see that the pattern begins to change. The moment we change the projection type, all the transform properties up here become available to us. And check this out. Maybe I want to continue refining the size of the, of the rocks on the image themselves. Okay. If I go over here to my size properties, and here's a great little trick. If you click on the little circle here, it's going to link all three of these channels together. Now, check it out, as I change the size, oops, I went too small. If I change the size, and it's because I'm zoomed in that it's going crazy. There we go. If I change the size properties, I can interactively kind of art direct how big and small I want those, those little rocks to be. Huh? Yeah, so I'm changing the size of the texture locator. So I link it, and then these arrows are sliders. So if you left click and drag, I'm zoomed in, so it's not, not, not doing it. But if you left click and drag, you can interactively change the size of the image on the polygon. Yeah, left click and drag. And there we go. And things are looking pretty good. I like that one. OK, let's do another one. Let's do another one. OK, uh, let's go out and find. 
maybe something for the top here. And we'll create a new material. I want this to be kind of like a plaster. Let's return to textures.com real fast and find a texture that's really going to work for us. So they just happen to have a category here called plaster. And let's find something that works. Let's, um, and this is my biggest problem because I, I want to go in and like shop for textures. One of the great things that the guys at textures.com have added recently is this button that says show seamless textures only. And then it's going to filter each category to show you the seamless textures that are going to work. Let's work at this one. This one's kind of compelling to me. However, this is a little bit of a challenge, right? Because this one, the one that I've chosen, is only going to pre or it's only going to tile horizontally. It's not going to tile vertically, right? If you look at the details of the image itself, Look at the actual details of the picture. Yeah, I got that big metal band up there, right? If this was going to be stacked vertically, we'd see that metal band repeating over and over and over again. So not all seamless textures are going to work both horizontally and vertically. This is one that only works horizontally. But we can still use it. That doesn't mean that it's taken out of contention here. We just have to understand its role. Let me download this one. Go. All right. Let's start importing it into Modo. Here's a, here's a great trick. Okay. A minute ago, we walked through the process of importing a texture into a material group using that add layer pull down menu. But there's also one other way that we can import textures quickly into Modo. And this is one of my favorites. I'm a drag and dropper. I like being able to go in and, and drag files around. And if I have Modo in the background, and then a finder window, window in the foreground. Check it out. Let's find it real fast. There's the rocks. Here's my plaster. I can drag the texture from the finder window into the material group, and it'll import it. Okay, And I'll place it inside of that material group. That's a handy dandy little trick. All right, so I have some problems here. And if you look carefully on this side of the, um, this side of the model, you can see very easily that metal band repeating inside of the texture or inside the polygon itself. So I need to make some adjustments. Ultimately, what is the first thing I should go do here? We just did it a minute ago. Before we even scale it, what do we need to change? Yeah, the texture locator, right? We need to change the projection type. Because the default projection type on all image maps when they're imported into Modo is going to be UV map. Now, we haven't talked a lot about UV maps yet. We're going to spend a tremendous amount of time in GCOM 424, which is the next class that you're going to take, by the way, okay, in this progression. Uh, we spend a tremendous amount of energy in GCOM 424 really digging deep into what a UV map is. Casually, a UV map is kind of like uh, the pattern of a dress, right? Imagine you have a birthday present sitting in front of you, and you very carefully peel back the wrapping paper for your birthday present and lie it flat on a piece of paper. Once an image is flat, I then can paint on it and wrap it back around our 3D model to get the illusion that we're after. Ultimately, using UV maps gives us a tremendous amount of control as to how our textures are going to look and where details are going to go. It's kind of an overwhelming process, which is why we don't necessarily talk about, uh, about it too much in this class. To give you a little preview here, here's all the UVs for my, for my little blacksmith shop, for my forge, right? And there are a bunch of them, OK? This is in, it's a big garbly gook mess, which is fine. Um, and this represents quite literally every single polygon on this piece of geometry, OK? It's a laborious process creating UVs. Because I have to go in and physically touch every single polygon and figure out a way to take that 3D model and kind of iron it flat, if you will. Yeah, question? Um, so when you're in UV mode, so what is that for? Yeah, so when you make a UV map, I then can create a texture set. Let me show this. Hopefully, this doesn't crash Modo. Um, OK, so there's all the UVs. And we pack them inside of what's called a quadrant, and specifically this positive UV quadrant. OK, once we have all the UVs, once we have all the polygons lying flat 
on a two-dimensional plane, I then can send this over into Photoshop and I can paint specific texture detail and specific te areas on the model itself. Each one of these outlines represents a piece of 3D geometry. So it's kind of like a coloring book in every sense. I create a coloring book and I can send this over to Photoshop. I can send it over to some high-end 3D painting programs like Mari or Substance Painter and really customize and create a unique paint job for this object. Okay? It's a tremendous amount of fun. It's actually my favorite part of the 3D pipeline because this is where our objects ultimately come to life and the character is driven or created at that moment. So we're going to talk a lot about this and we're going to go deep into UV mapping and the texture pipeline, the custom texture pipeline in GCOM 424. But let's go back and, and focus on how this tiling texture workflow is going to be used for us. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So I've been working on the, the plaster on my house here. And as I mentioned before, is it this side? Where was it? Let's go back into the model tab. I may have already changed it. Uh, well, regardless, I need to make some changes to my plaster texture, right? So the first thing we got to do, and this is something that we have to do on literally every single image that's going to be imported and used into our scene, is to change the projection type, OK? The projection type is responsible for how this image is being placed on the polygons, OK? So I want to change this one. Let's do a different one, because Cubic gives us a lot of control. There we go, OK? But there's some other ones in here that we can use. For a shape like this, for something that's rectangular, Cubic's a good one. What other ones could be applicable, you think, for a shape like this? Which ones are out? Which one aren't we going to use? Yeah, cylindrical is out. Spherical is out. UV map is out because we don't have UVs for this thing. Light probe is out. Implicit UV, box, those are all out, which leaves us with what? Planar and solid. Let's look at planar and solid a little bit here and get a very distinct, direct understanding as to how these are different and how they're the same. Let me change it to planar. And we'll zoom out a second here and whoa. Chaos has, ensu uh, has, uh, has ensued inside the model. And just give me one second here. I want to see if I can change the setting to make it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more easy to see. Yeah, as long as there's transparency on that texture, you can layer just like you can over in Photoshop. How do you know there's a transparency on the texture? Uh, you should see, if you open it up in like preview, you shouldn't see a background, or maybe it'll be like a checkered grid. Yeah. All right. So if you look carefully at the way this texture is showing up on the second floor of my house, it's looking pretty great on this side. Right? Looks pretty good. But the moment we look at this wall, we get this banding. This is called texture stretching or tearing. This is not good at all, right? What's going on in this particular situation? Looks like they just take and make a bunch of aligned points and stretch them. Yeah, in every sense, that's exactly what's going on. The texture works just fine on this side of the house, but on this side of the house, it's not working at all. It has everything to do with the projection axis of the texture that I'm using. The planar projection type should only really be used on flat surfaces that are not three-dimensional, like the ground or a piece of concrete, OK? Because the texture is only going to work on the polygons that match the projection axis. In this case, I'm using the Z axis. So imagine that there's a little camera sitting like right here, OK? And it's blasting the, projection, uh, the, the texture down the Z axis. Any polygons that are parallel to the z-axis are going to get the texture correctly. Any that are perpendicular are going to get that stretching like we see on the side. And so this is all good in here. But the, the, these on, those polygons are facing the opposite direction, so they're just getting the stretch. If I change the projection axis to x, boop, now we kind of get the opposite. 
The polygons that are aligned to the x-axis are getting the texture correctly. Everything else, we're getting that stretching. So the planar projection type is incredibly useful, but this is the wrong application of it, right? As I mentioned, the planar is really good for things that are inherently two-dimensional or are you know, ex extraordinarily flat. Let's look at the solid projection type. Solid is kind of magical. Let's change our projection type from planar to solid. And solid does a really good job. Solid does uh, some magic. Because ultimately what it does, and it goes through and looks at each of the surfaces individually. And the computer, based on some, some math, tries to figure out the correct way to project this texture on that surface. Okay? It's pretty magical. Um, it's usually the first one that I look at when I'm doing these tiny texture workflows. Because of the strength of the projection type, I can, this is usually the only one that I need. I very rarely use cubic because solid does such a really great job. Okay? Works for both cylindrical, spherical, and rectangular shapes, which is kind of neat. The default projection type? Yeah. Um, maybe. Yeah. If you go through your moto preferences, that, that may be something that's in there. Is that like, I mean, like, you probably some of this would use this application more than you would use that. Well, for the tiling texture workflow, absolutely. Solid and cubic are kind of our go to guys. Uh -huh. um, if, you need, if you need a custom paint job, uh -huh. like I just finished painting my train, I did a custom paint job on my train, everything got UV'd, right? Uh -huh. Because I wanted to be able to go in and paint rust in a very specific area. I wanted to put logos and badges and symbols on the train uh, in very specific, specific areas, and I needed a UV map to do that. So it's, you have to kind of pick your weapon to do, you know, based on what you're trying to achieve. OK, so I have some issues in here that I need to resolve on the actual texture itself. Because if you look closely, I don't like that metal band kind of going down the middle. So what do I need to do to the texture locator? Yeah, we need to move the texture locator, which in turn is going to move that metal band. Okay. Naturally, if we go over to the transform channels on the texture locator itself, we can make some adjustments. Specifically, I'm going to change its location along the y-axis. You can see that those bands or the texture is going to move. Now, this is kind of a give and a take, right? Because it's tiling both horizontally and vertically right now. If you go back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, in which direction does this tile or this texture tile correctly? Horizontally, Horizontally right? Yeah. I don't know. It, because it's being wrapped around a three-dimensional model, the Z is yes and no. But horizontally, is that's the way it textures correctly. It doesn't tile vertically at all. Well, check this out. We can actually turn this off if we wanted to. This is neat. If you look carefully, cruise down a little bit, inside your texture locator, we have this horizontal repeat and vertical repeat. Right now, both of their options are set to repeat, which is what we want horizontally. But vertically, we don't want it to repeat at all, right? If we change it to reset, it's going to completely break. But that's OK, because we just need to change the location of this. And maybe the projection type goes back to cubic, I think, on this one. OK. So there it is. Uh, I set my horizontal repeat. I just left it at repeat. In vertical, I set to reset, which basically turns off that texture from repeating vertically. Now, the big challenge that we have here is that we now need to place that texture in the correct vertical space in order for it to show up on the polygons. And you're absolutely right. We need to make it bigger, too. We need to make it bigger to fill that wall. Sometimes going through this process of figuring out the correct location of our texture is a little bit of a challenge. And you just saw me interface with that challenge a second ago, just trying to figure out, OK, how high? What value do I put in, in the position Y channel to get it to the correct location, right? The lovely folks down at the foundry have, have given us a really big helper. Check this action out. I think I have them currently turned off. Yep. But if I hit the O key and bring open my viewport properties, 
The visibility section inside of our viewport properties has a really great option that says show texture locators. Bloop. Okay. You have probably have seen this in many other areas. Have you ever wondered what these white cubes are or white spheres or cylinders chilling at the origin of our scene? Guess what? Those are the representation of a texture locator. Okay? A texture locator is an item, and I get to select that thing if I want and physically move, rotate, and scale it around inside of our scene and adjust the location of our texture. Okay? Now, uh, let's do this. I'm going to reset the location of my texture locator. There it is. So it's the big box down there at the bottom. And since the texture locator is an item, I'm going to enter into my item selection mode and physically select the texture. Now often, and this is kind of a selection issue that we have to overcome, often these texture locators are all at the origin. Selecting them individually can be a challenge because they're going to be, and you can actually begin to see that challenge here, right? I have another texture locator basically in the exact same spot as the others. If you have a hard time selecting the correct texture locator, you can actually do it over here in our shader tree. And this is how I inter interface with the selection of our texture locators. If you look carefully at the image, there's a little plus sign there. Okay? If you click on that plus sign, dun, 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 there's the actual texture locator that's been assigned to this image. I can select it here inside of our shader tree, which will automatically select it over in our item list, or excuse me, over in our viewport. Dun, 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 dun. And now, check it out. I'm just going to use the Move, Rotate, and Scale tool to get this where I want it to go. So I'm going to move it up. My snapping system is on. Let me turn it off. There we go. Wherever that cube goes, the texture goes too. Because in every sense, that cube is literally where the texture is going, okay? inside of our three-dimensional scene. Interfacing and interacting with these texture locators is a great way to very quickly place the textures three-dimensionally inside of our scene. You can also scale them up. Fire off the scale tool here. You can see the texture gets bigger. And within a couple seconds here, oops, hit the wrong key. My apologies, many apologies. Within a couple seconds here, I've done what I needed to do. You can even rotate it if you wanted to. So lots of good stuff in there. Yeah, so every image that's been imported into your shader tree is going to get assigned its own unique texture locator. If we click on the little plus sign, there it is. We click on it, and then we can use the Move, Rotate, and Scale tool in our viewport to place that image where we want inside of our scene itself. It moves the house, so you're not clicking on the texture locator. It looks like you're clicking on the mesh. Uh, AJ, what computer number are you? Let's take a look. Did you say 24? Awesome. All right. So, show, uh, so the one change that we need to make here is that we need to enter into item mode. There it is. And I can see in the viewport that the texture, texture locator is selected. Now be careful, because you selected a different one. Yeah, there you go. Rock and roll. I would use the item list to really drive your, or excuse me, the shader tree to really drive the selection of your texture locators. It's the only way that you're absolutely going to know beyond any reasonable doubt that you've selected the right one. All right, let's do one more, because I want to do these wood beams real fast, which introduces another little challenge to us. I'm going to return to textures.com real fast. Let's go into the wood category. And I think what I'm going to do is go into rough, because there's a really great tiling texture. This one right here, I think, is the one that I'm going to use. OK, let's download this one real fast. You get 15 credits in finger quotes per day. Per day. Yeah, good. it's pretty good. And basically, one credit equals one megabyte of data. Um, 
And if you're selective, if you only download the images that you know you're going to use, I mean, I've never run into my quota because I don't just download everything. I only download the ones that I'm pretty sure. And these, just, these are just pictures like any other pictures. In all honesty, I don't go back to this website anymore because I, you know, I have about 40 gigs of texture data on my workstation at home. There's a lot of the stuff that I've downloaded that I just save and I have it all categorized in a folder system in my, in my, uh, my home computer. So I don't necessarily need to go back to the website anymore. It's very handy. OK. All right, all right. So let's make a material group for our wood beams. Now, I have a little bit of a challenge in front of me because I got a whole bunch of these wood beams to select, right? And I need to assign them to, to a similar uh, material group. How in the world am I going to do that, man? What's a fast, easy way of selecting all the beams? Because we, we, we have to select them first before we can assign a material. We've got to select them first before we add a material. We've got to select them first before we, hit, before we add a material, right? How are we going to select all of them quickly? Holding shift, that's a good way, but man, that's, that's like, there's like 200 of these things. I just, I just don't want to sit there and like hold down the shift key and like double click 200 times. Pat, don't play that, right? That's a waste of my time. I like that. So now we're, now we're talking, but we have a lot of other stuff in the way. So what if, instead of selecting each individual beam, what if I select everything but the beams, right? Because I could very quickly go in and grab some big chunks of this, OK? And then, whoops, wrong. Uh, yeah, I can very quickly go in and grab big, big chunks, OK? Make sure I grab that. These things in here. This is the easy bit, right? I'm not necessarily going to invert my selection. I'm going to hide my selection. That way, I'm just going to hit the H key. So I just want to triple check, make sure that I'm not getting anything else in here. Hide those. Just want to make sure that I get all my wood beam stuff. There we go. Yeah, grab these two. A couple stragglers in there. I think I've gotten pretty much all of it now. So what I'm left with are all the wood beams. And now I can do a gigantic middle mouse button marquee selection, grab them all, hit the M key to create a material group. We'll call this wood beams, and hit return. There it is. I can unhide the rest of my mesh by hitting the U key, and that selection process took all but you know, 10 seconds. All right, since I have the texture, let's get it into um, our correct material group. Dun, da, da, da. Let's see, which one is it? Is it that one? It's that one. I'll just drag and drop it into the material group. Wonderful. OK. And now we have a humongous problem. Let's change our texture locator to, let's do solid. And it does a pretty decent job of, of putting the texture correctly in each one of those cubes. But it's mission success in some areas, but mission complete failure in others. And let's zoom in on the window here and talk about its successes and failures. Where is it doing it right? The grain, yeah. I'm happy that you guys are zeroing in on the grain, right? Because that, that is exclusively our problem here. On the horizontal beams, looks pretty great, right? But the vertical beam, not so great. The grain pattern's running the wrong way. So what are we to do? Here's kind of a great trick, OK? I'm going to go in, and I'm just going to do it on a couple of just to illustrate the idea. I'm going to create a new material group. So I want to have a material, a material group for all the vertical pieces, and then a material group for all the horizontal pieces. Okay. And I'll just do it on two. There are a couple of them here. So these guys, those are all the vertical pieces, right? Let's put it a new material, call this wood beams vertical. Okay. And now I'm going to go back over into my shader tree 
here's the uh, the original one. It's got the texture in there, and I need a copy of this. So I'm going to right click, and I'm going to duplicate it, and I'll put the duplicate in the other one. Okay. So now visually, we're kind of right back to where we were a second ago. However, if we continue to refine, maybe oh I don't know the rotation values of our second material group, we can fix our problem. Let's see what happens when we rotate this thing 90 degrees around the z-axis. And huzzah, now we're there. Simple duplication of the texture and assigning it its own unique texture locator in its own group allows me to start to customize this one texture onto many different polygons. Okay. Cool, huh? Yeah, very cool. The tallying texture workflow allows us to infuse a tremendous amount of detail quickly without too much huss and fuss. Do you have a question, Paige? Uh, yeah, I also noticed the horizontal beams have um, an issue with the, um, the bottom. Yeah, so maybe on those. Yeah, and so what we're talking about here is all of this jazz. Okay, let's look. So let's experiment. On our wood beams, let's change the texture locator from solid to cubic. Does that solve it for us? Not really. So this is a situation where a UV map would give us the most control. However, keep in mind, and this is the give and take of the tiling texture workflow, we lose a lot of customization. Okay, but at the same time, at the render view, do you see it? No. No. So I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to waste my energy trying to fix something um, that my audience is just not going to see. Yeah? No, because you're doing the exact same thing, right? When you manually move the texture locator, you're ultimately changing the values inside of your transform channels. Yeah? Um, so at this point, isn't UV mapping basically just a more refined um, version of Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And let me show you an example of this. I happen to have all of the UVs for this done, right? And this is where having UV maps really kind of really kind of shines because I can fix this problem down here with a UV map instantly, right? If I reassign, let's see, that one's. I'm gonna go UV map, okay? And right now, I, that one's so small. Here we go and. Go over into our UV Edit tab. Yeah. Since I'm using the Italian Texture Workflow, I can do this. Let me use my mouse instead of. There we go. Problem solved. Making UV maps is, a, is monumentally a pain in the rear end. It requires a tremendous amount of labor, but you can see that it gives us almost direct, immediate control on how the textures show up. Like I said, we're going to talk a lot about UV maps in GCOM 424. It's uh, in in every sense, it's it's one of the two reasons I really encourage you guys to go on to take GCOM 424 because GCOM GCOM 424 technically it's called game art, right? Um, and we we focus on, but really what it is, it's an intermediate level 3D modeling class, and uh, we focus on the game art pipeline. Because uh, the texturing workflow in, in the game world is very, very, very different. Okay, um, it the game art pipeline requires directly that you have UV maps for everything. Because in a game engine, we don't have those varying projection types like we have here in Moto, right? I can't cubically assign a texture to something in a game engine, right? I have to use UV maps. It's an exclusive kind of difference between the two. Um, and we also explore pretty directly the process of creating a character in GCOM 424 as well. Okay, we're actually about to enter into that module right now because I'm doing GCOM 40, 424 this semester. What about 401? 401 is our intro to computer animation. Yep, so that's an animation class. This Another good one to take. This requires some statistics. It is. Yep. What are the prereqs for 424? 424 basically just this class, 402. Uh, I'm planning on it, yeah. What about 401? Uh, I don't remember if 401's on the list or not, but maybe. All right, 
let's get back to work here because things are starting to look pretty good. I'm very pleased with the direction that we're going in. I'm just going to throw this back into, into solid. That way things generally look okay. And let's chat for a second here about lighting because we've spent some time today talking about the textures, but the textures are ultimately just one part of the lighting setup. And I apologize. Let me, I had to um, unhook some stuff here. All right, let's go over into our render environment here for a second and take a look at how the computer is choosing to draw. Oops, my little house. All right, so here's the front of the house. And I think I also have a shadow catcher. Let's turn that on so we get an illusion of the ground plane. And uh, here, let's, let's do this. Excuse the, the man behind the curtain here for a minute. There we go, because that's what we're used to seeing. All right, so this is in every sense kind of how the default render for our scene is, is going to look. If you look very carefully at how the computer is drawing the image, it doesn't really give us a compelling sense of realism. And for our house, I want you guys to start looking at the, the lighting setup to more accurately describe what it probably should look like. Okay, And it's really quite easy to do this. And it all begins with our directional light, the light source in our scene. Based exclusively on what you can see inside of the viewport here, what type of illusion is a directional light creating for us? You got it. A directional light is an infinite wall of light, kind of like our sun, that's, whose orientation determines the angle of our shadows and the angle of illumination like our sun, right? The sun doesn't change its position, its, its location inside of our universe, but its orientation changes. Well, basically, well, the sun doesn't move. Of course, naturally, we move around the sun, and we get the, per the, the perception that the orientation, the rotation of the sun is changing, right? So the location of our directional lights don't matter, but the rotation properties do. If you look down inside of your 3D view, there it is. All lights, every single light inside of Moto is going to be created and placed where? At the middle, which is called what? The origin. You got it. All lights are automatically going to be placed at the origin. And that little, that little tube there is a representation of our directional light. If I select it, even with it unselected, you can see it, but it's a little bit easier to see when it's selected. You see that little orange arrow coming out of the front? What do you think that's a representation of? Yeah, the direction the light is facing. So, and let me fire off my preview render, my preview window here, so we can see the changes as I, as I, as I work with them. If I move my directional light, do we have any change in the shadows and the lighting setup of my house? No, not a single change. I moved it pretty significantly away from the origin, and there, the lights didn't change inside of the scene. However, if I rotate it, now the lighting setup changes pretty drastically. So when it comes to working with directional lights, the location position does not matter. However, the orientation, the rotation of a directional light is going to have a direct impact on, onto the onto how it looks in the render. Yeah, go ahead. So if you don't see your directional light, it's a viewport property. So with your cursor inside your 3D viewport, hit the O key, and it's under the visibility section, and show lights and show cameras is currently enabled on my screen. All right, so this is pretty great. This is pretty great. I like the direction that we're going in here. Still not super compelling though, right? There's a couple things in here that we want to instantly change to get it a little bit more photographic. There's two additional features or properties that we need to change. I want you to look very carefully at the ground shadow of our light. How does it look to you? Ground shadow. Yeah. 
So specifically, talking about this stuff over here. How does it look? It does, as it naturally would be. What doesn't look right about it? It happens. Our mantra is save and save often. It's not an it's not a it's not an if it's going to crash. It's when it's going to crash, right? It happens. But let's look let's look, go back and look at the shadow for a second, okay? It doesn't look right. I love that you guys are instinctually, kind of subconsciously understanding that this looks wrong. Imagine the sun's out. I think today. Yesterday it was kind of rainy. But if we were to go out and stand in the sunlight and look down at the shadow that our body is naturally casting on the ground, how would it look? It would contrast point from where the sun is hitting the roof to where the shadow is being projected. Nope. The the Nope. Now, the wideness of it depends on the height or the angle of the sun to the object itself, right? Because as the sun rises and sets, then the shadow is going to change its shape. I'm kind of simulating a pretty high angle shadow here, so we're getting the correct reproduction of the shadow shape. But the shadow quality and how it physically looks on the ground needs a little love, needs some work. Right now, my shadow is way too dark and the edges are way too crisp, okay? As your shadow travels away from its parent object, it's going to lose energy. And the edges should be a little bit blurry. When we see dark, crisp shadows like this, it's an almost instant kind of tell that this is computer generated. Luckily for us, changing this channel is really quite of easy. I want to make sure that I have my light selected inside of my item list. And if we examine the properties here, what we want to change is the spread angle. A little bit of spread angle goes a long way. Watch what happens when I just change my spread angle to three degrees. See it? See it's starting to spread out a little bit? Okay. And now we're beginning to simulate something that looks a little bit more photographic. These spread angles uh, need to be finely adjusted. Don't go crazy with it. If you put this to like 15 degrees, then it's going to get really kind of wonky. Now we're kind of on a, uh, uh, a partly cloudy day. Above 15 degrees, it's going to start looking really weird. Here's a 30 degree spread angle, and now it's a cloudy day. Okay? Yeah? So, one thing that we've adjusted is the angle of the light. So, like the light not really going out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, because the spread angle is only affecting the shadow. It's not affecting how the light is interacting with this surface. This is a white surface that's being bombarded with white light rays. So naturally, it's going to overexpose. It's going to clip pretty quickly. And changing both the local material properties of the roof is a good, it's a good place to go right now. Because I think uh, right now the roof is being shaded by the base material. Let's look at it. Yeah, it's using a traditional shading model. If I just change the diffuse color to something a little bit, there we go. It's like this, only this first one. But the light angle absolutely has an impact on uh, the exposure, if you will, of, of certain parts of our model. That's something to look at. When we start putting textures on there, usually those problems go away. Because this is a gigantic light colored surface. Of course, it's going to reflect. OK. All right, let me go back to my directional light here and put the spread angle back to three degrees. It's a good place to begin because I like having that dark, crisp shadow. But we're still not kind of simulating how the sun actually looks out there in the real world. Okay? If I were to ask you to go outside or even open up the blinds in this window and ask you to critically look at the sun, don't actually do this because it's a good way to hurt your eyes, right? But what color is our sun? Orangey yellow, right? Orangey yellow. What's the default color of all lights inside of Moto? White. Okay. So we are 
our, the color of our sun is just fundamentally wrong, right? So let's change the color of it pretty quickly, okay? And it's really easy to do this. If we cruise down into our shader tree and look at the lights category, here's our directional light. And of course, naturally, every light is going to be assigned or is going to get assigned its own light material. And if I click on it, yeah, check it out. Now I can go crazy. I can change its color and a number of other properties as well. If you really wanted to get super geeky with this, you can even set the temperature in kelvins, which is the unit of measurement for light out there. You know, the, the scientific community has done a great, great job of measuring a number of naturally occurring phenomena. Believe it or not, all light rays have a defined color temperature. Okay? The brightness of that light source is going to have an influence on the color that it's emitting outside into our, in, into our universe, right? So if we do set temperature in kelvins, now we really are, once I examine the popover, now we really, 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 really are setting the correct color temperature for that light. And I happen to remember, just from my own experience, that our sun produces a color temperature of 6,500 degrees Kelvin. 60, uh, there it is. It looks very nice. It's just a slight yellow. Okay. If we compare and contrast, here it is at white. Here it is at slight yellow. Believe it or not, that little change goes a long, long way. Now, if we were, if we were doing something, here's kind of a great trick, by the way. I, I actually kind of prefer going this way. Um, if you open up your color picker, you can also change your color mode to Kelvin. Okay. And then you can you actually get a cool little pull-down menu here. So we can do um, overcast sky, sun through cloud or hay, daylit sky, and it's a range. This is a little bit, I don't use this one so much because it's a little bit too yellowy. Um, I like having it right around uh, 6,500. That's kind of my go-to for the sun. Um, for like an incandescent bulb, like if you look into my office, you can see I have a desk lamp in there. What color is that desk lamp? Yeah, it's much, 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 much more yellow, right? For an incandescent bulb, the color temperature is going to be like 3,200 degrees, which is very yellow, OK? Let's put this back to 6,500. Simulate, the, simulate this, this, the sun in the sky, and now we're getting a little bit closer and closer and closer. Now, one of the things that the guys, down, the guys and gals down at the foundry have done has uh, kind of taken this idea of the sunlight, and they have taken that ball and they have ran with it. Because depending on the time of the day, the color of the light is going to be fundamentally different, right? If you look at the, the quality and the color of the sun in the morning and compare it to like right now and in comparison to the evening, it's different, right? Our sun changes its color temperature throughout the day. It'd be great if we can simulate that pretty quickly inside of our Moto rendering engine, and we can. Check this action out. This is one of my favorite, favorite features of the directional light inside of Moto, one that you'll absolutely want to enable when you're doing the renders of your house this week. So I have my directional light selected. And if we go over to all of its properties, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to collapse the transform category just to make it in, uh, all that too. Check it out, physical sun. Let's turn it on and see how it changes our render. Now, at the moment, not a whole lot's going to change. However, if you look at the properties, we can actually dial in a time of day. So let's say I want to simulate what the sun looks like at, at 8 AM. And perhaps I'll just reduce the slider. There we go. You can see that things are changing around us, which is kind of fun. So here's the, the shadows are changing their location, which is kind of neat. Um, we can actually, if, let's do this. This is kind of fun. What's today's date? Today's the 26th, right? 26th? 10, 26, 2016. Okay. So now we're beginning to simulate the actual location of the sun on today, which is pretty neat. Okay. So it's what? 12, 11 p.m. Let's do 12, 11. There it is. Okay. Now that may be midnight. Let's let's be really sure on that. Nope, I think I was right. Yeah, just hit enter and it'll start to simulate that. 
Now, if you want, if this isn't the illusion that you're going for, the other one that I definitely want to make sure that you're aware of is this north offset. So this is going to rotate the sun's position inside of our three-dimensional universe. Okay. And if you really wanted to get geeky on it, you can even set like a longitude and latitude of your current location. They even have some presets in here so we can simulate how the fun would look like in Paris or how the sun would look like in Paris. Things change a little bit here, which is kind of fun as well. Now, what's, we're kind of getting a false read here on the impact of this directional light uh, and the physical sun characteristics of our directional light because of the background, right? The environment isn't changing its color to reflect the change in the time of the day, right? It's just that gray, ugly gradient, okay? Which is kind of changing our perception of the color of the light and the overall impact of the physical sun characteristics. We can change this. We can actually link the color of our environment to our physical sun, to this directional light. Check this action out. I love this, okay? Once again, I'm going to return to my environment section inside of my shader tree down here at the bottom. If I open it up, here's my environment, and specifically, the environment material. This change happens at the material level. If we look at the material properties, bum -ba -da -da, we have a physically based daylight category inside of our uh, environment material options. And we get to pick and choose. We get to pick and choose which directional light we want to we want to load the background information with. Let's, I'm going to zoom out because things are going to change pretty quickly here. Once it updates, come on. Still working in a gray gradient. That should. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, my fault. It's it's a two step two stage process. The environment type has to be physically based, which is basically basically going to turn off all of this jazz in here. And now, yeah, there we go. Now look at it. That's cool, huh? And I love this, right? Because we change the time of the day on the directional light. What's going to happen in the background? It's also going to change its time of the day. So here it is at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Here it is at 6 o'clock. Sun's gone down, right? Because the sun sets pretty early right now these days, right? Here it is, kind of like right around magic time when the sun's gone b below the horizon line, but it's still kind of light outside. That's kind of cool. Yeah, you can see, look at the shadows on, on the house. Now the sun's actually below the horizon line. This is kind of neat too. I don't know, you can actually, yep, there's the actual sun itself. If you look very carefully, you can see the bright spot. Let me change my north offset and see if I can spin. I think I'm going the wrong direction. Get that sunlight, the sun right behind my house. Somewhere right around in there. And if we go into our directional light properties and enable visible camera, now we should get a solar disk, which is pretty cool. That's pretty neat. And uh, let's change the time of day now. And step it down, see the sun set. We can, this, of course, this is an animatable property. So we can actually animate the sun setting if we wanted to. And it's pretty neat. Cool, huh? Yeah, it's some neat technology. It helps us kind of get a little bit closer to, um, to where we need to be when it comes to our renders themselves. Okay, so let's pretend that the sun's gone down, and there's the sun. It's actually, so it, it doesn't clip below the horizon line. If the guys in Gat would be neat to have the sun kind of automatically turn off once it goes below the horizon line, because it'll, it's just going to stay there forever. Let's see. There it is. Now it's well below, so it just keeps going. Now it's nighttime. Ten o'clock or eight o'clock at night. Now we're in the early mornings, and now the sun's starting to rise. It's just so much fun, huh? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, let's go back. 
and I want to put my sun kind of right at at dusk, right in here. I had a good, there we go, that's pretty, that's kind of nice, okay? But perhaps I want to go in and start simulating that there's a porch light on. It's pretty dark. Yeah, we can add as many light sources in our scene as we want, and it's pretty neat, to, and we should do that. Maybe we want to put a little bit more light at the door, or maybe we want to have a light on the inside of our house, okay? We can do that by very quickly going back to our item list. And remember, lights are items, okay? If we return to our item list, add item, lights, there's a whole bunch of them. We're going to talk about a lot of these individually as we go through the day, but I want to focus on, on the point light today. The point light is kind of the, um, it's, it's, it's pretty much the original light type in the CG, the CG industry, in the 3D world. It's a simple, very simple, it renders fast. Uh, a point light, if, oh, let's do this. If the directional light is like the sun, what type of, uh, of light do you think the point light is? Let's actually put it in the scene so you have a, oops, there we go. A point of reference. Where do all lights go when they're created? At the origin. So right now it's on the inside of my house. So let me, uh, there it is. You can see its icon. What does that look like to you? Looks kind of like a starburst, okay? A point light is like a light bulb. It's a single location in space, and light rays are being emanated from every direction in that single uh, point in space. That's the point light. It's kind of the inverse to the directional light. Uh, I can rotate the point light, and it's not going to change its effect. However, moving the point light is going to have a direct effect on our scene. And let's just put it up a little bit. It's just position, yeah. Directional light's all about... There we go. Now it's in that front room. It's way too bright, way too bright, okay? But luckily, I can go in and make some adjustments here, okay? Let's change the, the light, change its color. Let's do 3200, a desk lamp on the inside. That's better. We're getting there. Uh, in addition, if you select the light itself, the radiant intensity... That's a fancy word for brightness, okay? Moto is a physically-based rendering engine, okay? So all of our calculations and properties that we change are going to be scientifically driven, okay? Radiant intensity, that's brightness, okay? So if we lower this value down, there we go. Now it's not as bright on the inside of our house, okay? I like the point light. It's a pretty great light source. And it looks like, uh, yeah, this is, this is actually kind of cool. Initially, I thought it was a mistake, but it's actually doing it correctly. Uh, I was like, why am I getting light over there on the underside of my roof? Okay, I forgot that I actually have a window on that side of the house, too. The light's going out the window and ending up on, that, uh, on the underside of the roof, which is pretty cool. So play around with this. You may be able to want to, you know, you may want to put a point light or two inside of your scene to change the ch change the render, um, to look at it a little bit differently. Okay. Point lights. We're going to talk about more lights as we go uh, over the next couple weeks. Starting now, this is when I really start talking a lot about rendering in the course. We'll look at about lighting. I think it's next week. We spend a tremendous amount of time talking about the three point lighting setup. You look at the different other light types that we haven't talked about yet and their correct application instead of our scene. Now, inside the lamp, yeah. You got it. Okay. Right, so the presets. Um, are going to be in the light color. If you click on light color, 
what you need to change is your color model here, Paige. The default is going to be HSV, desaturation value, so the color wheel. But if we change the color model to Kelvin, now under the Kelvin degrees area right here, we'll get some presets. Actually, I take that back. You might not have to change. No, that, 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 this pull down menu is available in any one of our color, color models. It's right there. Good stuff. OK. So for our lab today, you built a little, a little birdhouse. There's also one thing, one other thing that I would like you to do today, or during the lab time. It won't take long. Happy Halloween, everybody. We're going to do a little jack-o'-lantern scene. And once again, it's going to allow us to kind of galvanize and participate inside of this tiling texture workflow. And look at the composition and some of the rendering stuff that we just talked about to help us drive a pretty great result. Okay? I've given you everything you need for this assignment. If you go down into the resources section of this assignment sheet, you'll find the jack-o'-lantern scene. It's right there. Let's look at it real fast. So your mission is to take this empty scene, untextured, and put some textures on it. So this is what it looks like. So where are you going to place your render camera? What's the picture going to look like? How do we need to colorize all the objects inside of the scene to help us create the illusion that we're after? All questions that you're going to have to answer yourselves and begin to figure out. Start thinking about composition. Where's that camera going to go? What's the picture I'm going to take? You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. I've done the hard, <laughs> hard part for you, right? You're welcome. <laughs> so I've made all the material groups. Now it's your job to find some tiny textures that you can place inside these material groups to get the illusion that you're after. Okay. I've mentioned many, many times in this, in, this in this class that at times we're going to be construction workers or engineers creating these wonderful shapes. Other times we're going to be painters by applying materials and textures to all of our objects. And then other times we also have to be photographers or cinematographers and, and really examine and understand the type of picture that we're going to create. Here's my suggestion to you. Before you really spend a tremendous amount of energy putting materials on every little bit in here, okay? figure out the picture you're going to take first. Zero in on that. Maybe the picture is just the jack-o'-lantern. Okay, because if you look carefully in here, you know, I'm, I'm not capturing a picture of the entire scene, right? I'm choosing to focus in on one specific element. I'm going to throw all my energy into those pixels, okay? I think far too often what folks do is that they try to make it a complete scene. And while that's really, really good, it gives us a lot of flexibilities. If we know the picture we're going to take first, we can really ensure that these textures look perfect and dialed and looking real solid. OK? Make sense? Also, and I think I forgot to do this, uh, I believe the jack-o'-lantern itself can be subdivided. Yeah. So if you select it and hit the tab key, all of those really harsh lines are going to go away. So make sure you hit the tab key on your pumpkin before you hit the render button. That way you don't see any of those really, really uh, offensive faceted edges in the render itself. Yeah. OK. Questions on what we're going to do. This should take you 30 minutes to do. Not that long. Because I've already done the hard part of making all the material groups for you. OK? Questions on what we're striving to accomplish this week. So there's two missions that we're trying to, to accomplish. The jack-o'-lantern scene, which shouldn't take long. And then you need to finish the model of your house if you haven't already finished it, and then put textures and materials on everything. Okay? Think about while you're going through the house project, think about the picture you're going to take, right? Don't spend a lot of energy trying to find and correctly apply a tiny texture that you just don't fundamentally see in the render. Okay? Make sense? Questions? We're making a picture. 
Yeah. We're fundamentally in the 2D business. We use 3D modeling and animation tools to make two-dimensional images. Unless you're going in the game world, that is totally different. But yeah, we're making images. The game art classes, then we'll talk about complete objects and their role within an entire scene. It's a little bit different kind of thought process and putting all this stuff together. All right, questions, questions, questions. Everyone good? All right, good luck. May the force be with you. We'll see you guys next week.